Hey there, still January 13th, Wednesday, still comic book day. In the first part of this week's reviews, we covered Marvel books, and in this part, we are covering DC books, which this week is mainly Batman and Superman. So, we're starting with Batman and Superman, as I just said. So, this book, um, we're getting Bruce Wayne Batman, Full Power Superman. It's a uh, flashback sort of arc. Uh, with right now, and uh, that's why I'm picking it up after not picking up this book for a couple months. Um, and we start out with uh, a scene that, I mean, you know, considering this book was probably written four months ago or something, uh, just a bit of sour timing, honestly, with this opening scene with a uh, an astronaut doing a spacewalk and... Uh, Something bad happens as she starts to drift off into the void. Um, but she's a commander, not a major, so it's not a not a full not a full thing. But um, uh, and also she ends up being saved by Superman, so bit of a a better ending there. And um, after this brief rescue of the astronaut, Superman discovers the main plot of this book, which is a, uh, a giant dead body found on the surface of the moon that uh, carved out Superman and Batman's logo as they died on the moon. Um, as a final kind of, I guess, you know, thing to ask them for help. So then we go back to Gotham, where or Superman rather goes to Gotham to fetch Batman. Uh, Superman helps Batman defeat Clayface a little faster than Batman expected to, and the two then go investigating on the moon with Batman performing a sort of space autopsy on the giant dead thing and discovering that uh, this was a murder and it was set up to look like uh, an accident. Um, Batman and Superman are being watched by someone who I won't spoil uh, because we're already reaching the end of the book. Um, and whoever is watching him then uh, becomes, I'm guessing, the kind of the main villain of the book. And we're left to find out what, uh, why exactly the giant person was killed, and all that other stuff is kind of left a mystery. You know, the drama part of the book, um, the things we don't know. And, uh, so, yeah, so far I'm liking it. I'm liking the interactions between Batman and Superman, which is, of course, the main thing in a Batman-Superman book. And the uh, plot seems, well, like it's leading to big places. It's already cosmic. It's already something involving space giants and, um, an alien character who we haven't seen in a bit. I am at, like, I haven't seen him in a book in a while, so, um he'll appear, and that might be cool. Um, hopefully it'll be cool. Um, but, anyway, that that's pretty much that. Uh, the art's really good. Um, just really enjoying the art in this book. So we have the, the title page here. Um, the, the spread I showed you of the dead guy on the moon. I think it's just the art, I think, is really fantastic in this issue. Um, the mid part in the middle where we see the Clayface fight that I didn't really show much of. That part's really... It's it's a really pretty book. Um, and again, the, the, like the main part of this, the main bulk of why you would buy it is to see the interactions between Clark and Bruce. And those are as you'd expect it. They're good. Um, Bruce is very broody. Superman's very, come on, we gotta do this. Bruce is almost too smart in a way. Um, he's, you know, he's... This is a, 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 a this is a Batman who has an astronaut suit and, and you know this is that sort of Batman. Um, this is a Batman who can also see like incredibly tiny cameras that fly about the moon. Um, so that's pretty much that good first issue. I feel um, really getting back into the swing of the you know classic world's finest duo. So excited to read more of this. Next up is Batman and Robin Eternal, issue number 15. And for the fa uh, past few issues, we've been following um, 
we've been following uh, Nightwing and uh, Harper Rowe and Cassandra, so now we are back with Tim Drake and um, Jason Todd as they are uh, digging deeper and deeper into the Order of St. Dumas. Um, so we begin the book with uh, Azrael giving himself a little pep talk, well not giving himself, but receiving a pep talk um, from the Order, uh, telling him to um, kill, you know, to, to, to kill the Robins that defeated him before, proving that he can remain to be, you know, remain as Azrael if he's still worthy. And immediately after that ends, Tim Drake just happens to show up at his door carrying an unconscious Jason Todd. Tim Drake saying that he brought Jason Todd as a sacrifice because he wants to join the Order. Of course, this is just the plan. Um, the two are working together in order to just get in to St. Dumas. And uh, Jason is given a tour of the place and they have all of this incredible technology. Meanwhile, Jason breaks out of the hole he was trapped in and so we get to see the amazing technology of St. Dumas and Tim is wowed by it because it's supposed to be impossible. We see Jason doing some jailbreaking of his own. Uh, there's a quick little divergence to a flashback where um, Scarecrow gives Mother a uh, psychological profile of Batman. Meanwhile, Batman and Robin head off to Cairo um, in order to meet Scarecrow one more time. And then we get to the big fight scene between Tim and Azrael. It's a fight to the death to see who becomes the next Azrael, because Tim is lying about wanting to join um, the Order. We find out that St. Dumas is an actual person, um, or rather, it's a title that is bestowed onto a person who then becomes St. Dumas. Um, is it Dumas? Is it, do you pronounce the S in St. Dumas? Am I pronouncing the whole thing wrong? Um, and then we uh, things escalate when the uh, Jason and Tim's plan doesn't quite work as they expected, and then Saint Dumas, the person, takes control of the whole situation, and things get uh, weird. Um, well, not so much weird as in they they get messy. Messy is a better word. So yeah, it's a weekly again. Weeklies are kind of hard to review because you don't know what's the big step exactly. Um, and the flashback in this issue seemed just entirely distracting. I feel we could have removed those pages entirely, maybe replaced them with a bit more of the St. Dumas thing, because um, they really just feel like a distraction from the rest of the story. It's two pages out of the entire book. And um, yeah, and then just the, 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 the actual end of this book, after we see Tim and Jason's plan not quite what was planned is is a bit rushed um and then when we get to the actual ending it's i mean it's leaving it open they're going to continue this story for another issue maybe another two issues with the robins in saint dumas um so we'll see how that goes i guess continuing now with flipping the page in my little notebook where i keep my notes about the books is robin war number two the final part of the robin war crossover um so lots of spoilers that i'm not really going to talk about instead i'll just talk about uh, the lead up to those spoilers and what happens in this book so we start with um a single robin um one of the we are robin robins who after everything that happened getting locked in the cage and all that decides that he doesn't want to be a robin anymore and goes home to play video games and uh, the video game he's playing is, of course, Batman Arkham Knight, which just raises so many questions about the DC Universe. Like, even if it's a completely different game, right? So it's not a game about Batman, who we know is Bruce Wayne, and who reveals himself to be Bruce Wayne, and all of that. So even if the game is not about Bruce Wayne as Batman, but just about these characters, Batman and Robin, that happen to exist in their world, who who is making this game? Um... Does Wayne Enterprises own the licensing rights to Batman and Robin? Uh, are, are Batman and Robin in the public domain? So are they like Sherlock Holmes and anyone can just make a video game about these characters? Um, it just it just it raises so many questions to have a Batman video game inside the DC Comics universe. Um, meanwhile, the rest of the Robins uh, meet up with Damien, who has become 
part of the Court of Owls and has, you know, so all the Robins are finding out that Damien betrayed them and joined the court, and there's a big fight between the Owls and the Robins. Um, and meanwhile, uh, through all of this, Dick is watching from the nest of the Court of Owls. He saw that Damien is now an owl, um, and he and uh, Lincoln March, Owl Man, decide to uh, make a deal about the fate of Damien, the fate of the Robins, and everything else. And we are left to see whether or not uh, Dick accepts the deal in order to spare the Robins or not, or finds a third option. The fight between the Robins and the Owls eventually narrows down to just Damien and Duke Thomas, and the fight actually gets really cool. Um, we find out a bit more of like what, like what would Duke Thomas bring to the role of Robins? Um, if you have that, you know, Dick is the original. Dick is the heart of the Robins. You have Jason, who's the, I guess, like the bad boy. He's the the one who's willing to do anything to go to any lengths, pretty much. Tim is the detective. Damien is the rightful son. And we see what... And you had Stephanie, but Stephanie is no longer a canon, canonically a Robin. So we have the four Robins, and then we see what Duke Thomas brings to the role. What Duke Thomas' contribution to the Robin legacy would be. And judging from his fight with Damien, it's that he gets into people's heads. He knows what makes people tick better than any other Robin. And he can size up Damien in a snap, just as he did with Dick Grayson in, um... And I think it was the Grayson issue of this crossover where uh, Duke and Dick had their one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and from then on, the rest of the issue is pretty much the Robins versus the Owls. And we see whether or not Damien decides to stick to being a Robin. Um, and we get, you know, we get his explanation of why he turned coat. Um, and we see whether or not he remained a, uh, in, a, an Owl until, you know, going forward. And we find out the choices that Dick makes while in the nest of the Court of Owls. And um, we find out who, by the end of this, who is the new Robin. Um, who gets to wear the name of Robin by the end of this. And I mean, that's what the whole thing is about. That's what this whole crossover is about when it comes to, I think, a satisfying conclusion that opens up a lot of new storylines. Um, I'm curious to see how the fallout of this book is reflected in Grayson and Robinson of Batman, um, because those are the books I read. Um, so, and it also involves Dick and Damien, who are, along with Duke Thomas, kind of the two main characters in this book. And, um, yeah, so I, I quite like this crossover. Um, I mean, the, the highlight is still Grayson, um, just because that was essentially um, I'll Make a Man Out of You, the comic book. Um, but overall, this crossover was better than it was worse. Um, it was better than Convergence as a whole, I feel. So that, I mean, that's a pretty low bar, but still. Um, yeah, that is Robin War number two, and as a whole, I guess, as an entirety. And the last DC book I picked up this week, and probably my favorite of the DC pulls, was Superman American Alien which just continues to be a blast. Um, although, on this cover, Clark this is supposed to be Clark Kent. Uh, he kind of looks like uh, like Plastic Man. Uh, but the thing with the, the Batman symbol in the wake of the boat is pretty cool. Because this story involves um, Clark Kent, after crashing in a plane while on a trip to the Bahamas, climbs aboard a yacht, and and immediately gets mistaken for Bruce Wayne. Um, and so he crashes Bruce Wayne's 21st birthday party on Bruce Wayne's yacht and immediately starts to impersonate him. And also at the party, we have basically the richest of DC's rich. So he's immediately greeted by uh, Oliver Queen. Uh, we see um, Vic Zaz on the boat, who's a Batman villain, who was very wealthy and then lost all of his money gambling. Um... Uh, Sue Dibney, who is Ralph Dibney, the elongated man's wife. Um, who else is here? Basically, every rich person um, in the DC universe is here, 
including uh, Barbara Minerva, um, who takes Clark aside and they have a uh, kind of a very intimate personal relationship while on this boat for one night or so. Uh, we see Clark kind of cut loose and have a lot of fun. This is his first time out of Smallville. Um, like, this is his first real vacation, and, I mean, it's a big one, so he cuts loose. has fun that he didn't think he'd have. But he also gets kind of philosophical, um, seeing all of this wealth. Um, he notes that he's, he's in a jacuzzi eating $4,000 caviar crackers um, that could have paid for, you know, surgeries all over the world. And um, as he's talking to Barbara Minerva... He says so he wants to be a vet because, of course, he has this great compassion and feels a need to help people or help living beings who can't help themselves um, and can't, you know, speak up for themselves. So we see, you know, even though he's being very hedonistic at this party, we see that he's still Clark Kent. He's still the guy who becomes Superman, um, even if he's still kind of refining his, his whole philosophy behind it. It's still kind of rough, as uh, Barbara points out. Um, we get a quick little appearance by Deathstroke, who also believes Clark Kent to be Bruce Wayne, and Bruce Wayne has a bounty on his head from Carmine Falcone, um, or Falcone, I guess. I'm never sure how to pronounce that. Um, so Deadshot makes a quick appearance, and then as soon as it happens, as fast as it happens, it's over. The boat parks, and we see Clark move on to his next little adventure, I guess. Um, so yeah, no, it's a fun issue. It's it's fun, it's fast-paced, it's a big party of an issue. We have a Deathstroke appearance, which is always nice. Um, and we get we still get, you know, character work. We get uh, an older Clark, like young adult Clark, 20-something. I'm guessing he's supposed to be the same age as Bruce Wayne, so 21. First time outside of Smallville, really. Um, and he's... He does it in a big way. He goes from, you know, small town farm boy to, you know, billionaire cruise ship party. Um, and we see him adjust to all that and how does that affect who he wants to be and him making a new friend in Barbara Minerva and all that other stuff. So another just really great issue um, as we get, you know, closer and closer to that point where Clark decides to be a superhero, we see more and more of his the reason why he does it and just his compassion behind it and how he wants to there, there's a bit in this book where he's talking to Minerva he's looking at the stars and about how he's uh come to like come to terms with the fact that he's insignificant but we're all little aliens on this planet together and so we're we're all we got pretty much which yeah no I'm I'm just really really enjoying American Alien and uh if you're a Superman fan I think you will too and so I recommend picking it up. And that is it for this week's DC books. If uh, you're more of a Marvel person, I reviewed those in part one of this week's reviews. And in the next and last part, I will be reviewing three more books that aren't DC or um, Marvel. They're Image, Dynamite, and Dark Horse. So if you're interested in those, maybe stay tuned, watch that. If not, thank you for watching this video. Um, if you care about my uh, opinions on other DC books, every week I pick up a few, I review them, so if you're interested in that, please subscribe, like this video if you liked it, any comments, questions, concerns, anything whatsoever, please leave them down below and I will try and get to them. But, either you're moving on to the video or not, I want to thank you for watching and I hope that you join me for some more comic book reviews.